Um, hey guys. Um, hey. <laughs> hey, Winter. Um, hope y'all are having a good day. Um, so as we always do, you know our last class was on the historical context working into um, blackface. So we're going to do a little review before we actually jump right in just so to make sure we remember everything that's happening. So um, I'm actually going to ask you guys if you remember anything from our last class. So you know, you know some things about the differences between the North and the South um, leading up to the Civil War, particularly economic and cultural. Um, can anyone see that? Um, the North is more industrialized, the South was still like the agricultural like economy, and the North had a ton of railroads by that point, but yeah. the South did it. Very good. Anyone else on that? The North relied a lot on immigration, while the South relied on slaves. Correct. So you guys are anyone else? Um, now, besides economic, culturally, I mean, we can talk about slave a little bit, but can anyone talk about um, white perceptions of African Americans in these two different regions? Just well, in the South, they were more viewed for their personal labor, so they were dehumanized in ways which even led to southern plantation owners uh, raping their mm -hmm. slave women to continue the process of producing more slaves yeah. for them. Um, in the north, it they started to have a little more sympathy for the slavery and understanding the vials of the system, mm -hmm. but there were still many subdivisions of people that kind of wanted to send them back to Africa. Very good, Jimmy. Gold star for you. Um, <laughs> As Jimmy was talking about, um, just because there was more sympathy towards the African American in the South or in the North didn't actually mean um, that there were necessarily ideas of equality running around um, in the public discourse. Um, Abraham Lincoln himself was, for the most part, for a colonization movement, as in sending um, Africans back, or African Americans back to Africa. And this wasn't necessarily because of some like violent reduction that you see in the South, like we, we don't, we think see the African Americans as a threat, so let's send them back. This was quite a bit more sympathetic, as you said. It was this idea that we actually see later from Malcolm X, who says that um, they just didn't believe that it was possible for there to be equality after like so many years of slavery and like the degradation of the African American. They were just afraid that if they were to remain here, equality could never be achieved. So people like Abraham Lincoln were more for that route. Um, at the same time, um, leading into the Civil War, we have um, Americans moving out west to manifest destiny. We've talked about that in the past already. Um, yeah, a, just a continual westward expansion um, has to do, of course, with some American sexual exceptionalism, um, but at this point, um, just, this was just in the Midwest. Um, we're still wearing like all the way up um, to the West Coast, at least not formally. Yeah, so keeping all that historical context in mind as we move into um, our main topic for today, um, black blackface performance and minstrelsy. Um, there are other types of blackface performance. Um, like legitimate stage plays that use uh, blackface characters, um, but what we'll, we'll be talking about today specifically is minstrelsy, um, which these are the men. <laughs> but um, as you see here, like typically white males um, done up in this is usually the black stuff you see on their face was usually like burnt cork that they rubbed all over the face, and then they also accentuated their lips with lips, red lipstick. Um, Kind of creepy looking, if you ask me, but I think that was a little bit of the point. Um, so I started with three big men in the in the origins of Mitchell C. First, you have T. E. Rice. Um, he was actually a northerner from New York. Um, grew up in an integrated neighborhood, which was pretty interesting for the. He was born in 1808, so pretty interesting. Um, um, but he did a lot of extensive travel in the South, where he came in contact with a lot of um, slave plantations. Um, 
which is how he came to be so good as a blackface performer. A lot of people um, praised him for his use of African American dialect, um, which really like separated him from other sorts of blackface acts. Um, he is the one who created the famous character of Jim Crow, um, the most prominent character by far in all of minstrel acts. Um, his first song um, was called Jump Jim Crow. Um, and you see in this first, um, in one of the lines from the song up on the screen, um, turn about and wheel about and do just so. And every time I turn about, I jump Jim Crow. Um, that was supposed to be a reference to a sort of um, African American dance, um, which was had a lot to do with um, like doing a sort of jig, as they say, and there's supposed to be a lot of drinking involved. Um, and everybody at that time would have understood that sort of reference. Um, so T. D. Rice was actually a um, one-man performance, though. He um, never joined with any other people. Um, so he was actually the forerunner of minstrelsy, because minstrelsy really depended on group performance and like a musical band dynamic, and he didn't have that. He was all on his own. Um, he usually opened for other sorts of shows, or was part of like a comedy variety act, but it was never just him. Um, Dan Emmett, on the other hand, um, grew up in the South, and he started um, the Virginia Minstrels, which is where we first see this, like, the prototypical um, minstrel show. You have a four-piece band, like you would have seen these four guys. Um, they would have done, a, like, a variety of one-act sort of things within one big show. Um, and it was always tied in with dancing and musical numbers. Um, Dixie, the song that he wrote, um, actually became... Oh, I'm sorry, I said Dan, it's from the South. That was a lie. He's from the North also. But um, he wrote the song Dixie, which is about a man in the South longing for like the good old days of chivalry and such. Um, and it actually became the unofficial anthem of the South during the Civil War, which he greatly regretted. Um, in response, as he noticed it picking up in the South, he actually wrote um, a music manual for the Union, saying, like, I don't want to be a part of this. I'm pro union all the way. Um, going on to the third father of minstrelsy, E.P. Christie. Um, he was actually from the South um, and was the only one who was actually in close proximity with slaves most of his life. Um, he worked in Florida with um, where he oversaw a group of slaves, um, which also gave him that sort of um, he knew how to, he picked up on their dialect as well, he used that in his own shows. Um, but he, on the other hand, stole a lot of Dan Emmett's material, um, copied a lot of it. I mean, just look at the name of his group compared to Dan Emmett's. Um, he claimed that they were the original, but really, he knew that he wasn't. Um, he actually took over a Dan Emmett's spot on Broadway um, after the Virginia Minstrels uh, dispersed. Um, what really set him apart, though, is he, even though Dan Emmett made the, the structure for a minstrel show, E.B. Christie really improved upon it. His band was by far the best in the country, um, and he also um, kind of made the material a little less salacious, whereas Dan Emmett, um, even though it was about like African Americans often have references to like sexual behavior, um, and other kinds of tomfoolery, and he took that out to make it more um, audience friendly, um, which led to his great success on Broadway. Although Dan Emmett was, both T.E. Rice and Dan Emmett, Dan Emmett um, performed in the Broadway area in New York, E.P. Christie performed there for 10 years straight, and he opened his own set of what he called opera houses um, across the nation where he performed, um, or not necessarily him, but him and other ritual shows got together and performed these sorts of acts. Um, they were primarily, I mean, so these three guys were performing at big name theaters like the park, which was typically reserved for upper class Americans. Um, but for the most part, minstrel viewers were fined in New York, at least to the Chatham and the Ovary theaters, um, which is where a lot of working class people went. So this was really an entertainment source for the working class people. Um, and as I've already mentioned, um, 
Minstrelsy was really dependent on musical and dance numbers, um, but also comedy was essential. There was no um, serious minstrel show um, or dramatic minstrel show. All of them, um, either individual minstrel acts or minstrel shows, were always comedic in nature. All right, so um, we see over here um, on your left um, a picture of Jim Crow, and this is would be one of his lyrics from the song The Old Virginia Breakdown. Um, I'm going to read the lyrics, but I'm going to exclude the N-word here because I want you to take note of it because that's important when understanding the historical context, but I don't feel the need to promote that kind of language. So um, read along with me, please. My mama was a wolf and my daddy was a tiger. I am what you call the old Virginia. Half fire, half smoke, a little touch of thunder. I am what you call the old Um. So maybe take a minute or two. Um, look at what Jim Crow's wearing. Look at these lyrics. Um, brainstorm, or tell me what you're seeing up here. Um, because there are a few indicators of what Jim Crow is all about. Just from these two things. And I'll call on you in like 30 seconds. Or whenever you're ready. You can wait to be. Um, right. He looks kind of stereotypically feminine, like hand on the hip mm -hmm. kind of thing going on. Yeah. Which is interesting. We'll come back. Looks like he's trying to dress well, but he's not. Yeah, you see his toe exposed down there at the bottom. There's no seriousness to him, so he's just like practical joke. Yeah, very good. Anyone else? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, guys. Um, so, as you guys already noted, not much serious to, seriousness to him. Um, his office or his pants are patched, um, he has a huge hole in his shoes, um, and so super good analysis of this picture, guys. Um, but looking to the words from his song, it gets a little bit more um, complex. Um, I'm just going to say for now, we'll come back to it in a second. Um, note the animal in imagery, um, as well as this half smoke, half thunder, or half fire, half smoke, and thunder like sorts of like magician images you're getting here, right? Um, so, as we said, this is the character of Jim Crow. Um, Ryan, it's interesting that you said that he was effeminate, because he's actually supposed to be the super macho one. <laughs> um, he has a counterpart who is by far super effeminate. Um, but he was supposed to be this like rough and tumble, like I wanted to get into fights, I want to like showcase my grit and impress all the ladies. Um, he was actually modeled after um, River Boatsman, who like, speaking of the frontier where these were also performed, um, came, kind of came out of those sorts of images, like Davy Crockett, um, rough and tumble characters that you might see in Mark Twain. Um, as I said, he loved to show off his strength. Um, he also really liked talking about politics, which you think is probably weird <laughs> for um, a blackface character. Um, but this was done in a sort of way where, um, again, it's, it's a comedy routine. He was trying to show how much he knew about like the what to know in that day. So he would try and bring up politics, and they were always just one big joke. Um, and lastly, we bring up those non-human elements, the tiger, the magic. Um, when we're thinking about what the goal of blackface performance was, there's really this sense that although um, E.B. Christie himself actually said that he was trying to give a faithful account of African American life, when really I think you can see just from the lyrics that that wasn't very true. It was indeed a caricature of what, of how white men perceive black men for the most part. Um, so really like as we talked about like the slave system was like built on the dehumanization of African Americans. So when you literally dehumanize this person by making him half tiger, half whatever it was, bear for wolf, got it. Um, and like a 
also throw in some mystical, magical elements, like this person that they're, that, like, huge audiences of white people are watching see that African Americans indeed are human. Um, and as you may have noticed, Jim Crow, where does that come up again later? Correct. Um, so, even though this Jim Crow laws were like a few decades removed from this, or about a century, um, it's still harkening back to that same dehumanizing image, um, which is also, of course, what the Jim Crow laws were founded on. Okay. We're going to do the same activity again, give you a little bit of time to think. Um, you guys can read this. Um, and examine this picture, and we'll come back and throw some thoughts out there. Is it really recording? <laughs> yeah, that is true. He has no neck. I think it's hidden behind a collar, but yeah, it doesn't really look like it. Yeah, well, well, like his shoulders are up, and then he's like a. <laughs> um, I compare his dress to um, Jim Crow, anyway. For he looks more clean than mm -hmm. the other picture. Ryan, say you're commenting about this guy. <laughs> yeah, he's very effeminate and kind of almost like has like that hourglass figure close Ooh. to like. <laughs> okay. No, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, and I'll talk about the lyrics of this because this one isn't quite as obvious as the Jim Crow one. Um, but. If you guys weren't exactly sure what he's talking about, his long tail blue is his tail coat, and he's all about that. <laughs> um, so this is Zip Coon, your name. I mean, that doesn't seem super effeminate to me, but whatever. Um, he was a character created after Jim Crow, um, but these two were by far the most popular of any of the minstrel characters that you would see. Um, he was known as a Broadway swell, Broadway, of course, being in the North, a New Yorker. Um, he was not from, of course, as I just said, he not from the South. He was a freed black man in the North. Um, but he, the, being the polar opposite of Jim Crow, was super effeminate. Um, very much cared about his appearance. Um, was not rough and tumble. Tried to be manly to impress the ladies, but never quite did it because he was so effeminate. Um, and coming back to that tailcoat thing, he was obsessed with like fine goods and all the trapping of like northern culture or whatever. Um, so again, looking to what this says about African Americans through the lens of like white perception or whatever, um, he, as I already mentioned, a lot of the minstrel shows happened in New York. Um, so for those audiences, they'd be seeing this and thinking, Huh, these are the, the, these guys are the black men that we see around us every day. Um, and during the 19th century, masculinity was super important. Like, I mean, we still have remnants of that today, but to be masculine was to be virtuous, in fact, which is, um, so not only was, even if a black man could achieve humanity, because, you know, he was in the North and people viewed him a little bit better, he could never be a true man, because, he was pretty feminine. Yeah. Um, now, we talked about the two biggest characters, but if you think at all like me, maybe you're wondering why are there no slave characters? That would seem obvious. Um, but in fact, leading up to the advent of the minstrel show, um, there had already been slave narratives all over the place. Um, so I think in creating this new form of entertainment, they didn't need to cover that same ground. Although, of course, in minstrel shows, there sometimes were acts devoted to like plantation songs or plantation narratives, but those weren't nearly as big because the identity of the African slave had already been kind of um, formed in the minds of white Americans. This, is, um, this quote is from The Irishman in London, which came before the minstrel shows. It was a stage play. Um, but this is coming from the character of Cubba, who is um, a female slave. Um, she says, um, she's talking to someone who is trying to woo her and make her leave her white family. She says, me walking home one day, a man, her master, or slave trader, 
took me from all my friends. Me shall never see them again. But Missy so good since she by me. Me no wish to go back when my father great king. So she was royalty in Africa, but she's saying, um, because my white family is so good to me, like of course I would never want to leave them. Like this is the best circumstance for me, you know. So also creating this narrative, or Mitchell C already came into this narrative where like. African Americans were submissive, they were kind of dumb, like you can, and all that they could ever possibly want in life was to belong to, literally belong to a white family. All right, so we talked about how um, menstrual characters portrayed African Americans to the minds of um, white Americans, but something we also have to take into account is what it says about the people who were performing these shows. Um, if you think about it, this happens today too, but as people perform, they're not just talking about their characters, but they're talking about themselves. Um, so this really gave white men a vehicle to talk about taboo subjects um, that would incriminate them if they presented themselves without the black face, if they presented it without a mask. Um, for example, we have this song from one of um, E.P. Christie's songbook. Um, he says, put down that jug, touch not a single drop. I have I've given him many a hug, and dare you leave him stop, I kiss him two, three times, and then I suck him dry. That jug, he's none but mine. Previously in the song, he says he's talking about a whiskey bottle, but I'm sure I don't need to say what you're actually thinking of mm -hmm. when you read these lyrics. Um, as we talked about, even the, um, besides being performed in New York, a lot of these shows were performed on the frontier, which were primarily um, composed of male settlements. Um, so as ideas about homoeroticism started to come up, um, of course, if we're to be the virtuous masculine men that we are, we can't talk about that because that makes us more feminine. But if you put on blackface and say that a black man is talking about that, that gives you the freedom to talk about whatever you want, to express all of those things that you've been feeling or that you've been wondering about, um, but at the expense of the African American. So, in conclusion, this course is about popular entertainment in the United States. But why is that important to study in a historical context? Because we need to look today at the entertainment we consume and see what it's saying about our lives. And we need to look at what entertainment we choose to partake in because that says something about what we believe, um, the things we value, and um, that is reflected to the world and to history.